To begin our Sunday afternoon radio news summary, the situation in Washington remains clouded. No reply to the president's note has been received from the emperor. And now for domestic news. As those who attended church this morning know, the weather in this area has been clear, with the temperature in the 50s. It's 85 in Miami Beach, where the first of the winter crowds have appeared. And even in the northern areas, where early ski practice has begun, it's a mild day. Traffic hereabouts, the police warn, is especially heavy. If you're planning a little drive this afternoon, avoid the main routes as much as possible. This applies especially to Dinner. the areas around the larger cities. Dinner is ready. The inevitable Sunday accent toll is not expected to be a set. We interrupt this program to bring you a flash from the NBC newsroom. The president has just announced from the White House that the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. The days whirl by in headlines. The president appears before the Congress. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. And thus a year ago, America took up the challenge. Now at last, the wake of great events has become visible. Now at last, the president has considered it safe, with our troops firmly in Africa, to trace the pattern of this year. In England, Prime Minister Churchill has told the same inside story to the House of Commons. This picture is their story told with the films of the events, whose meaning Mr. Churchill and Mr. Roosevelt now reveal. The story begins late in December, when the Japs were driving down Malaya. Mr. Churchill had come to Washington for the first war conference. He spoke before the American Congress. The events of the year have proved him a true prophet. I think it would be reasonable to hope that the end of 1942 will see us quite definitely in a better position than we are now. And that the year 1943 will enable us to assume the initiative upon an ample scale. From this beginning, Churchill and Roosevelt aimed at that one objective, assuming the initiative. Quickly, American troops sailed, secretly, of course. The president has revealed that our military captains thought then, in those early months, that we could attack Hitler best by invading Nazi-held France sometime in 1942. In the Pacific, Churchill and Roosevelt faced inevitable retreat. MacArthur and his men fought their desperate heroic delaying action in Bataan. Then Malaya, the campaign that revealed long rehearsals by the Japs, long perfecting of troops in jungle fighting, so that Singapore fell. Then Java, the Dutch East Indies, rubber, oil, all gone, while a heavily outnumbered Australian, Dutch and American fleet stood and died as a shield for Australia itself. And still, we heard of no plan for attack. Remember the Houston. No American ever could, nor will, forget the Houston. Not these Navy volunteers from Houston, Texas. Not the hundreds of thousands who flock to the colors of every American city, town, and village. Not the millions who registered under selective service so that every man, young, old, rich, poor, stands in line for the call to duty. Women everywhere sprang to serve their country, to learn the ways of industry, to pick up the drill press jobs when the boys left to pick up guns. The response of American manhood and womanhood still was the ace in the president's hands. But Mr. Roosevelt also had his problems at home. The immediate pattern was home defense. Driving hard, earnest work wrought miracles, only too often despite conflicting directives from conflicting Washington bureaus. Headaches for the White House and for the country. 
Splash! Victory! Air and sea victory in the Coral Sea off the northeast Australian coast. The country thrills to our first great triumph over the Jap Navy, over the sneak carriers that had delivered the thrust in the back at Pearl Harbor. The score, 11 Jap warships sunk, six more badly damaged. But, Mr. Roosevelt warns, this is still defensive warfare. We have not yet begun to fight. On the East Coast, Mr. Roosevelt faced the problem of tankers, torpedoed, shelled in harbor, sunk, with little gasoline reaching the east. Rubber went with Java, now Hitler struck at gasoline, which is to say war production. Rationing came in and unthinking American chiselers, a low percentage, were forced into line. Midway, key to the Pacific, remains American. A little bomb damage on the island itself, but at sea, a tremendous, a vital naval victory, with five Jap cruisers, a big carrier, and many transport sunk. The threat to Hawaii struck down. Good news indeed for America and England, but still another defensive victory. Molotov flies from Russia, urging speed for the second front. He returns to a desperately, bitterly anxious Kremlin. Mr. Roosevelt reveals now that he still, at that time, figured on a channel offensive. Mr. Churchill, in keeping with secret plans laid at the December conference, appears suddenly in Washington in middle June. The president and he confer with Allied Council of War on a situation not so good. The Japs have made a fantastic conquest clear to the gates of India and Australia and now Alaska. The Nazis have hurled divisions, whole armies toward Stalingrad and the Caucasus and Egypt and the Suez. Enemy pincers are closing. Churchill, sick at heart over the Libyan setback, sees the new American tanks, the General Shermans. He asks for them and he gets them. Tanks for action, for Churchill and Roosevelt have made their pattern for victory. Double blows against the Hun. On the north and east, British sea power and Russia's might. South to Africa for the American and British drive. By July's end, the enveloping circle was planned. So to Egypt, tanks. On President Roosevelt's order, tanks and all our newest tools of war are loaded for convoy and Egypt bound. In the grateful Churchill's own words, quote, one ship in this precious convoy was sunk. Immediately, without being asked, the United States replaced with another ship, carrying an equal quantity of weapons, unquote. Churchill himself rushed to Egypt. The hour was critical, and Churchill himself wanted to tell his fighting men that American weapons were on the way. And old Winnie told them, we cannot fail. Then to Moscow, and Churchill relaxes by taking a turn as pilot. Churchill had to take the report of the Washington decision to Stalin, and the news for Joseph Stalin was no second front in France. The Nazis rejoiced. The Russians quietly endured. Even Americans wondered. But Churchill and Stalin used the same words to one another. Complete understanding exists between us. Stalin kept the secret of the substituted African front but told the world of the burden Russia had borne alone, the savagery of the long fight across 2,000 miles of Soviet land, the misery, the bitterness of suffering. Stalin had newsreel pictures that speak for themselves. Recaptured Russian villages and the search beneath the winter snow for loved ones, butchered by the Nazis and left for the white drifts to shroud. Grim, real, awful pictures. But millions of Russians have stood against the Nazis through grim, real, and awful times. Meanwhile, London's Trafalgar Square, New York, San Francisco, demanded the second front, not knowing that the die was cast. Churchill and Roosevelt took the clamor on the chin, but ordered action in the West. Air action, mighty raids by British bomber armadas. Later, American planes swung aloft, hammering raids over France, raids to ease pressure on Russia, to give Yanks in Ireland time to train. Night 
rage that left miles sown with fire. And one third of Germany's air force was withdrawn from Russia to guard against invasion in France. Land action at sea. Convoys to Murmansk to strengthen the giant pincers to the east, to aid the stand of Stalingrad. Hell's Corner British and American convoy men called the Murmansk trip. There were losses. British and Americans died here, but not in vain, for Russia gained the strength for savage counter-drives, wholesale slaughter of Nazi beasts, even as we closed in on Rommel in Africa. Action and deception in the West. American General Eisenhower planned in London, and then Eisenhower apparently tipped his hand. American troops had new winter clothes. Many lips whispered, winter uniforms for Norway. And across the channel, German ears heard. Hitler thought not of Africa. Hitler jittered over cold Norway. And while Americans steamed south, German troops landed in Norway in feverish numbers. Churchill told Common soberly, when his knowledge of the real African plan must have made him gleeful, that 10 German divisions were building fortifications in Norway. Troops in Norway worked happily against the stupid Americans, thought to be Norway bound. Americans Africa bound, old glory starting the long hard pull to victory, coming to grips with the bewildered Nazi through Oran to Tunis and Bizerte, carrying the message of liberation, winning strategic Dakar by diplomatic expediency, diplomacy, military power, strategy, all in the pattern for victory. Half a world away, strategy and power against Japan. Millions of square miles to be slowly, painfully won. But we have started. Marines wiping out the Japs. Marines winning Guadalcanal. Navy guns attacking, winning the Solomon Islands battle. China holding on six years, a giant in the grand pattern. Hold on to, Americans, you builders. You are the pattern for victory. Your army will purge the conquered lands. Your air force will sweep the vaulted skies. Your navy will command the seas. Three mighty teams depending on your work, your sacrifice. Our leaders are determined. Have faith, Americans. Have strength, untiring strength. Thus, let freedom ring.